Welcome, everyone. This is session three of Multidisciplinary Approaches to Human Rights, our workshop from the Human Rights Center. Um, I'm Kristen Reed. I'm the director of the Human Rights Fellowship Program. And I'd like to say a little something about our fellowships, if you don't know about them already. Uh, the 2011 fellowship is just opening up to applications. Um, these fellowships are open to students at six UC campuses now. Berkeley, Davis, Hastings, Irvine, San Diego, and Santa Cruz. And the fellows receive a $4,500 stipend to work with a partner organization on human rights issues in the field. So if you'd like to learn more about the Human Rights Fellowship Program, please visit our website uh, at hrc.berkeley.edu. And you can also learn more about the uh, 2010 Fellows Projects by visiting also our website or by coming to our 2010 Human Rights Fellows Conference, which will be held on November 4th at the International House. And I've just passed around some postcards for you. Uh, the deadline for the 2011 fellowship application will be February 24th, uh, February 24th 2011. So um, now let's get to our great workshop. Uh, today we are very, very lucky to have Adam Hochschild. He will be talking about covering human rights issues in the Congo 100 years ago and today. Our workshop sponsors are the Human Rights Center, Bolt Hall Committee on Human Rights, and the Felton E. Henderson Center on Social Justice. Um, and of course, we've provided snacks here, so please enjoy them at any point in time. Adam Hochschild is a lecturer at the UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism. His recent book, Bury the Chains, Prophets and Rebels in the Fight to Free an Empire of Slaves, was a finalist for the 2005 National Book Award. Please also check out the BBC History website for a great multimedia presentation of the material in the book. It's really good. He frequently writes on human rights issues and has worked as a reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle, a commentator on NPR's All Things Considered, as an edit and as an editor and writer at Mother Jones Magazine. So please join me in welcoming Adam Hochschild. I guess I don't need that. So. <laughs> well, thank you, Kristen. It is very nice to be here. Uh, I assume that you've all done the homework because a pop quiz will follow my remarks. Um, I understand that the other tools for dealing with human rights issues that you've heard about in this series or will be hearing about uh, include things like legal issues, forensic science, the use of statistics. Well, I'm going to talk about a much older and simpler tool uh, for dealing with human rights, which is the very ancient tool of storytelling. Um, because I feel that in order to make people care about issues of human rights and social justice, especially people who don't think that they're interested in a particular problem, a particular issue, a particular patch of history to begin with, uh, you really have to pay a lot of attention to storytelling if you want to reach a wider audience and make people concerned. Uh, one of the things that particularly fascinated me about the people I wrote my last book about that Kristen, Kristen mentioned, Bury the Chains, the 18th century British abolitionists, was that they were, I think, the first determined group of human rights activists to discover the importance of storytelling. Um, they came to the fore in England in the uh, 1780s. Uh, people in Britain for a long time had been, you know, a small number of people had been outraged by slavery, had been trying to do something about it, had been producing books and pamphlets and whatnot on, on the subject, and nobody paid much attention. Then this abolitionist movement came to life in an extraordinary, very dramatic, very sudden way in about a five-year period from 1787 to 1792 that culminated with the House of Commons uh, passing uh, a bill banning the British slave trade. Didn't go through because the House of Lords failed to pass it, but it was the uh, first national legislative body anywhere in the world to ban slavery or the slave trade. And 
they did so after there was an enormous amount of pressure put on them by the British public. Nearly 400,000 people signed petitions, for example. One of the things that happened during that five-year period when this movement suddenly came to life and suddenly reached a large number of people, perhaps the most important thing that happened was that the participants in it discovered the value of storytelling. Up until that point, most argument, public discussion in Britain about slavery or the slave trade had been carried on in terms of citing parts of the Bible, writing long, ponderous works of moral philosophy, and so on, which reached relatively few people. In that five-year period, for the first time, abolitionists discovered the tremendous impact that uh, people's stories could have on people. Uh, Olauda Equiano, a former slave who had earned his freedom and made his way to Britain, wrote uh, an extraordinary autobiography, which has been rediscovered in recent years and is quite widely read today. Uh, with very little philosophical argument, it's all about his own life experiences, about what it was like to be a slave and to see other people in slavery. Uh, John Newton, whom we know best as the person who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace, had been a slave ship captain in his youth and uh, wrote a very forceful, uh, quite apologetic and abashed pamphlet about his own experiences in that trade. Alexander Falconbridge, a former slave ship doctor, was prevailed upon by the abolitionists to write an absolutely searing book-length description of the things that he had witnessed uh, in the four slaving voyages on which he had been a doctor on board slave ships. And books, pamphlets like this had an enormous impact, woke people up uh, to the tremendous power of storytelling. A little bit later, American abolitionists discovered this too. Uh, you know, what was the book that had the biggest effect on turning Americans against slavery? It was Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, the most widely read American novel of the 19th century. Uh, it's said that when Abraham Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe at the start of the Civil War, he said to her, so you're the little woman who started this big war. And this is just, I'm going through this particular patch of history to make uh, the point about the importance of storytelling, especially when you're trying to wake people up to an injustice that they're not aware of or that they've heard about only very dimly. So for myself, when it comes to writing about a human rights issue and trying to reach as wide an audience as possible and make people care, it all comes down to the question of how do I tell the story? What's the most effective way to tell the story? So let me start by talking about uh, King Leopold's Ghost, which I gather most of you have read, right? OK. Um, I think the, there's nothing mystifying about the ingredients to a good story. They've been the same ever since Homer, been the same for thousands of years. Three basic things, characters, scenes, plot. Novelists have to use these techniques, dramatists, movie script writers, and nonfiction writers as well. The only difference for nonfiction writers is that absolutely everything has to be true. You can't make anything up. But you're still following. If you want to reach people, I think you have to still use those very, very ancient tools. Now, when it comes to characters, the story of King Leopold's Congo was really God's gift to a writer, because nobody could make up people like this. Uh, King Leopold II of Belgium, uh, brilliant, greedy, charming, conniving, uh, an absolute genius at public relations who could have taught today's American tobacco companies a few things. Um, Henry Morton Stanley, the extremely ambitious, anguished, uh, uh, unhappy, uh, but determined explorer who helped him seize this huge territory in, in Africa. And uh, heroic figures like Edmund Morell and Roger Casement, um, who exposed what the king was doing and uh, figured out 
how to bring this to the world's attention. Uh, black American heroes like George Washington Williams, the journalist, William Shepard, the missionary, who went to the Congo and reported what they found there. And a number of Congolese figures whose lives, unfortunately, we know less about because they're less documented than those of the Europeans and Americans, but are nonetheless extraordinary people. Um, King Afonso, in the early days of the Portuguese conquest, who saw what was happening to his country and didn't like it. Uh, rebel leaders like Nzenzu and Candolo, whom I talk about in the book, led rebellions against the regimes. And then, of course, in the middle of this enormous horror show, sailing up the river on a steamboat comes one of the world's greatest novelists, Joseph Conrad, who then wrote about it all. Y you couldn't make up people like this, really. So I felt, in writing this story, that these characters had just been handed to me on a platter. Uh, also handed to me on the platter were a number of extraordinary scenes. And I really feel that in any kind of writing, if you want to bring a situation alive, if you want to make people uh, care, you have to paint some scenes. Uh, we experience life in scenes. You know, we go through the day that way. Um, when you go to watch a movie, you expect it to unfold in scenes. You don't just want a narrator droning away, talking to you on the screen the whole time. Well, there are some extraordinary scenes in, in this story. For me, the one that still sends chills up my, science, my spine, and it's why I began the book with it, is that of uh, Edmund Morell on the docks of Antwerp. Young man, 25, 26, junior official of a British shipping company. The company sends him to Belgium every couple of weeks to uh, check in and check out their ships as they arrive there on the Congo run, bringing riches from the Congo to Europe. And Morel stands on those, <coughs> those docks and realizes, as he tallies up the cargo, that uh, ship after ship is arriving packed to the hatch covers with these enormously valuable cargoes of uh, ivory and rubber. He knows how labor-intensive gathering wild rubber is. And he sees that nothing is going to Africa to pay for this stuff. No merchandise, no trading goods. The only thing the ships carry back there to Africa is soldiers, firearms, and ammunition. And from that, he deduced that there was some kind of system of forced labor or slavery uh, going on thousands of miles away. Uh, as I say, it still gives me chills when I think of that great moment of moral revelation that he had, especially since thousands of people had worked on those docks for years, seen the same thing, and thought nothing of it. I've been back to that dock a couple of times myself just to pay homage to him. There ought to be a plaque or something there, but there isn't. Uh, other scenes, you know, George Washington Williams and Joseph Conrad sailing up the river and seeing um, the nature of King Leopold's regime and describing it. Um, Edmund Morell uh, working furiously in Europe after this revelation on the docks, uh, trying to bring people's attention to this. Roger Casement in the Congo investigating uh, for the British government, coming back, writing an excoriating <coughs> report. And then these two men meet each other for the first time. Uh, and become lifelong friends. Uh, and of course, 10 years later, they don't know it, but they're going to end up in the same prison. Um, and happily, each of them left a record of that meeting so you can construct what happened there. Um, again, you couldn't make up stuff like this. The plot of the book sort of wrote itself because it unfolded chronologically uh, I didn't have to do any fancy jumping about in, in time. And I think there was an inherent suspense built into the story because for the first half of the book, it was partly a, a story of cruelty unfolding, an immensely cruel regime uh, getting situated in place, uh, people who were there, who were eyewitnesses, such as the American and British Swedish missionaries, observing this, writing about it, feeling anguished about it, trying to draw people's attention to it, and not succeeding, because very few people read 
uh, their church newsletters and missionary magazines. And then along come Morel and Casement, and they can take their story to the world. Uh, the story was also a fascinating one for me to work on because it was also partly a story of people trying to figure out how to tell the story. How do you make people care about this place? Not only do they know very little about it, but you know the, the European public had been pretty much hoodwinked by King Leopold into thinking that he was a great philanthropist who had, was doing things in Africa for the benefit of the poor benighted natives, and heaven forbid making money from it was the farthest thing from his mind. How do you break through that and convince people of what's going on? And they thought long and hard about how to best tell the story, and they devised some new methods of doing so. Uh, the major one of which was using a slideshow. You didn't just go out and talk to a public meeting, a church con congregation or whatever. You showed slides. Uh, I think it was the first major use of photography in a human rights or social justice campaign uh, of any kind. And when I discovered that those actual slides still existed, and when I found them, on, uh, uh, in two dusty old wooden boxes on some shelves in London, I knew that had to be the final scene of the book. So that's my very ancient uh, toolkit. A um, couple of other things I could say. One thing I think that is good to keep in mind when you're trying to tell a story that is this long is it's good if you can have several strands of it. This, again, is a classic storytelling technique. You know how every Shakespeare play has subplots. Uh, every hour-long drama you watch on TV, you're switching back and forth between one strand of the plot and another, and then finally they come together at the end. Well, there were enough characters involved in this, doing things in enough different places, Stanley in Africa, Leopold in Europe, Leopold's lobbyist uh, in the United States, that I could kind of switch back and forth between them, sometimes from one chapter to the next, sometimes within a chapter. And then, of course, you always want to end each chapter on a suspenseful moment where somebody's wondering what's going to happen, and then switch to the next character. And then you bring everything together uh, at, at, at the end. So that's my very, very old-fashioned toolkit, characters, scenes, plot. Um, let me say one final word about King Leopold's ghost, which is simply when you're doing human rights historically, uh, where do you find this kind of information? Uh, where do you get the data? Where do you get the facts, the quotes, and above all, the human voices? Well, 90% of what was in this book I found a couple hundred yards from here at the main library on campus, which is a terrific resource. Um, visited a few other libraries as well that had things that Berkeley didn't have. But uh, there was an amazing amount of data uh, there. And it still is astounding to me that since Edmund Morell uh, in about 1910, nobody else had written a book in English about all this uh, aimed at a general audience. Uh, a lot of you know, scholars had bit off one part or another of the story. Uh, some people had written about it in a very, very scholarly, academic way, but nobody writing for a large audience. Uh, and this about a situation where you know, the population of this territory was slashed by about uh, 10 million people over a 40-year period. Well, what sorts of data were useful? What kinds of material did I find in, in, in the library and in other libraries? First of all, several of the uh, participants in the story, the characters in the story, were themselves writers. Uh, Morell did nothing but write for 30 years. Books, pamphlets, articles, you know, published in newspaper, uh, <coughs> wrote thousands of letters, a vast cor corpus of material. Uh, casement uh, wrote his uh, famous report, kept a diary. George Washington Williams wrote his open letter to King Leopold. 
and letters to a couple of other officials as well while he was on his trip, in one of which he was the first person, I believe, to use the phrase crimes against humanity. Uh, if you look up in older editions of the Oxford English Dictionary, you know, that tells you the origin of words and phrases and so on, they'll all say this originated at Nuremberg in 1945. But there's a form on the Oxford English Dictionary website where you can submit information. And I referred them to the usage in, in something that George Washington Williams had wrote, but I've not checked back to see whether they've updated it properly. <laughs> um, uh, Henry Morton Stanley wrote a book about every one of his uh, expeditions. And as well, he wrote diaries, letters, newspaper articles, some of which contradicted his books in interesting ways. Um, the missionaries wrote letters, they wrote their memoirs, uh, they wrote for religious journals in the United States, in Britain, in Sweden. I found a graduate student on campus who translated some old Swedish missionary newspapers for me and uh, several missionary archives were very helpful uh, to me. Um, I used my research assistants. Who were my research assistants? They were the biographers of several of these people uh, <clears throat> who saved me the trouble of going through all of uh, Henry Morton Stanley's letters uh, <clears throat> or uh, George Washington Williams' letters. Uh, and I, I do think very often you find in secondary sources like that enormously useful material, sometimes written by scholars who don't fully sense the human impact of the material that they have assembled. Um, then there were many, many scholarly works that had useful information for me. That extraordinary scene uh, of Morel on the docks at Antwerp came from a scholarly edition by two professors of an unpublished manuscript of Morell's, and I bet not more than 25 people have read the whole book. But once I saw that scene, I was just mesmerized by it. Um, in recent years, the diaries of a couple of Belgian officers who worked in King Leopold's private army <coughs> have been published in academic journals in Belgium, and I was able to get them. Uh, one extremely useful source, uh, an oral history of a former Congo rubber agent uh, and head of a rubber post on the river there named Raoul de Primorel, uh, I owe totally to the fact that Berkeley has an open stack library uh, because it doesn't appear in anybody else's bibliographies. Nobody seemed to notice it because it was a, a book uh, privately printed by the Historical Society in Stockton, California, as I remember, where this guy ended his days in the 1930s, and before he died, somebody took an oral history of him. So it may not even be in any library outside of California, but it had fascinating material. And I always, in all the books I've done, I've, I've found magnificent stuff by simply looking at what's next to the book that I think I'm looking for on the shelf. <laughs> And you find fabulous things there. Um, then I got a lot of material from newspapers of the time. Uh, and uh, there were two publications in Belgium uh, in particular that were, uh, you know, from a very colonialist point of view, that were concerned with the Congo. Uh, one, was, uh, one was a weekly and one was a monthly, as I recall. Uh, but you know, published throughout these years and had very detailed information about uh, which agent was at which post when and progress of steamboats up and down the river so I could figure out things like did George Washington Williams steamboat and Joseph Conrad steamboat cross paths in the river on August 1st, 1890. They did. Um, the uh, the thing that was harder to find, of course, was African voices uh, from this era. Uh, it is outrageous that during this period when, as I say, the population was slashed by 10 million people, uh, worked to death in the rubber terror, uh, died during the famines that resulted from it, uh, shot down in uprisings, uh, 
uh, died of disease because they were half starving from the famine. There is not one complete autobiography or full oral history of a Congolese uh, during those decades. Nonetheless, there were two collections of Congolese voices which I drew from. Uh, one was, you may remember if you've read the book, that King Leopold sent an investigative commission to the Congo in 1904-05 that uh, he thought was going to clear his name and produce some good propaganda. Uh, it uh, backfired, even though all three judges on this commission owed him some favors, they nonetheless did their job and uh, <clears throat> produced a report that confirmed essentially all the atrocity reports that uh, Morel was voicing. Uh, they took testimony from about 300 people, most of them Congolese, uh, Leopold succeeded in getting the, the actual transcripts of the testimonies locked up and not released at that time. And they remain locked up in the archives of the Belgian Foreign Ministry until the 1980s, when finally people got access to them. And those had some Congolese voices. There were also two remarkable uh, Belgian priests, missionaries, who worked in the Congo in the 1940s, 50s, 60s. And in the 1950s, they went out and gathered oral histories from people who were still alive, who had survived the rubber terror at the uh, turn of the century. Uh, and the uh, Belgian Royal Academy of Colonial Studies refused to publish their material, but they published it in a, a small uh, journal of their own, which happily was on the shelves in the main library. Um, okay, let me turn uh, more briefly to the, did, did you have a chance to read that, the magazine piece in Mother Jones? You didn't. I see most heads shaking. All right, well, let me try to des describe it because it was, it was circulated uh, uh, in the announcement of this, and it is online. But um, So I'll sort of describe what I was trying to do there. Uh, I returned to the Congo for the first time in many years uh, last year, the summer of 2009, and I did pieces for three magazines, the New York Review of Books, uh, uh, the Atlantic Monthly, and Mother Jones. And for the piece for Mother Jones, I wanted to write about the gold mining area in the Northeast. And one of the things that has been true of the Congo's history for centuries is that this is a part of the world that is enormously rich in things that people elsewhere want. You know, 120 years ago, 130 years ago, it was ivory. 100 years ago, it was rubber. Today, it's uranium, uh, coltan, diamonds, tin, anything you can name. Uh, and the vast majority of the people there get no benefit from this and are scraping along on the equivalent of a dollar or two a day. Um, you know, you stand anywhere near the eastern border in the Congo and you see planes flying overhead carrying tin ore that's flown out of a big mine in the interior. You see trucks barreling along the road carrying timber. All these goods are leaving the country and people are not profiting from it. I had the chance to travel to the gold mining area. The, <clears throat> this, uh, the, the Congo produces more than a billion dollars worth of gold a year, and of course the price of gold is uh, at unprecedented heights right now. And I just wanted to see what it was like where the wealth was produced that's making people outside the country so enormously rich and not benefiting people there, and what it was like. So I structured this piece, um, again, I, when writing a magazine article, just as when writing a book, I try to think in terms of you know, characters, scene, plot. Um, and by plot, I mean the structure. So I made the structure of the article as a journey, a journey to the source of the gold. And that particular journey began in Bunia, the capital of the Ituri district in the northeast. And uh, then I traveled up a road, a long road trip of about four hours. And 
there were various things I saw <clears throat> along the way that were relics of the colonial era in one way or another. So I was able to use that trip up the road as a, a way of bringing in the history. Uh, I may possibly have brought in too much history for a magazine article, I'm not sure, but uh, I always have to restrain myself on that. But um, I tried to use this device of going up the road to talk about the things seen along the way, such as the ruins of an old swimming pool that had been for European staff at a now defunct mine, uh, <clears throat> hospitals and schools built by the Belgians in the 1920s when they realized it was uh, more efficient not to kill off their workforce by a forced labor system, but to give them some kind of rudimentary education and medical care so that they would stay alive, reproduce, and uh, be more efficient workers, and so on. Then uh, I got to uh, a <clears throat> place where uh, a major multinational mining company, Anglo Gold Ashanti, is in the process of doing the preliminary work for uh, building what is probably going to be a billion dollar mine uh, <clears throat> involved, which will involve uh, chewing away a whole mountaintop, moving a village that's on it, uh, and <clears throat> making themselves an enormous uh, amount of money in gold. And <clears throat> I and the uh, 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 wonderful woman from Human Rights Watch, whom I was traveling with, were able to go into the mining company's compound, which was surrounded by barbed wire. And uh, uh, people in a remote spot like that are often so desperate for visitors that they don't realize what they're revealing when they show you around. And <clears throat> you know, we saw all the mining machinery and equipment and their plans for cutting off this mountaintop and moving the village and uh, computer models of where the, exactly where the gold is under the ground. And of course, the poor Congolese are going to get none of this, you know, you know, a few pennies, if any, on the dollar. Uh, <clears throat> then we went to a nearby uh, mining town where artisanal miners, people who go out and mine gold by hand with picks and shovels, come in at the end of the day to sell their stuff. So even on a Sunday night, uh, the shops in this village were very busy with people coming in, these uh, exhausted looking miners <coughs> selling tiny little bags of gold dust or nuggets and with the money they got buying supplies, you know, a new shovel blade, some food, and things like that. So we hung out in, in, the, in the shop for a while. And then the next day uh, went to the place where these um, <clears throat> artisanal miners were working, who were just essentially using exactly the same techniques that people used in 1849 in the California gold rush. You know, you <clears throat> find a, a river or stream, you uh, dig and dig, you um, uh, get earth that you think has a tiny amount of gold in it, you put it into a sluice, you use a bucket of water to pour water down the sluice and have a blanket or something on the bottom so the flecks of gold dust will sink to it and then you go over and pick out the gold dust and hopefully at the end of the day you have a few dollars worth of gold. Um, these people were working, this particular team that we went and watched was working at the bottom of a valley that was quite a long walk down to it. And on the way down to this valley, <coughs> we met um, a miner coming up and um, uh, a guy who had had at least a high school education. In fact, he said he dropped out of high school uh, uh, for money reasons. He spoke good French. We asked him what he was doing and uh, he said that he was a cascadeur which any of you who are French film buffs know that that's the word for stuntman. But in Congolese slang, it means somebody who is working odd corners uh, where there is gold ore to be found, who is not part of the usual 12 to 15 man teams who work in a group um, constructing one of these sluices and pouring water into it. 
And uh, he was jubilant because he and a friend, it was, it was only 11 o'clock in the morning, and he and a friend had already found uh, what they thought was the equivalent of about a dollar's worth of gold. And he showed it to us, a tiny little plastic bag with gold dust in it. And they were making this long trek back up to the village uh, to sell it right away because they had no money. So we went, we observed the miners at the bottom, uh, <clears throat> and then we walked back up uh, out of this place. It was enormously hot. Uh, got back to the mining village and ran into this guy, the cascadeur, on the street again. And he reported that uh, they'd sold their gold, it had given them enough money to buy breakfast, and now they were going back down into the mining area enough, again, mining area to try to find enough gold for them to buy dinner. And I feel I've never been so close to somebody who was literally living hand to mouth. Uh, and in this country of enormous riches. So that was the point at which uh, I ended, ended the article. I think I did OK on the plot structure. I had some good scenes in there, meeting this fellow twice, uh, hanging out in the shop where people were selling gold, seeing the multinational mining company. But that uh, I failed. And when it came to characters, because this was a story that uh, did not have uh, enough fully developed people in it. Uh, I did it on the basis of I had only two days to spend in this area. Had I been able to be there longer, I would have liked to do something like try to get to know that solitary miner, uh, see if he would let me work with him for a day, go back, see where he slept, see if he would let me come return to his village with him, uh, something like that. Because ultimately, I think it's only through bringing people alive that you can really uh, reach an audience uh, and move them. And if I go back there again to do any more reporting, I would really like to find the right person or persons uh, to profile, because I think it would be much more effective uh, writing. And I think telling stories that way is what makes people pay attention. So why don't I stop here and see what kinds of questions you've got? Because I think perhaps I've talked long enough. So fire away. This is all being recorded for a podcast. Sorry. So. <laughs> okay. uh, it's either interpreted a story about a phenomenon like slavery or genocide, or a story about a case like the Lord's Resistance Army or the Armenian Genocide or Darfur or whatever. And it's, it, intuitively, I would think that could have a big effect on what impact the story has, on what lessons people draw, and whether whether that story keeps on working after the case is closed, so to speak. And I'm wondering whether the storyteller has any control over that or whether it's just something that you have to experience the, the effect of and you, the audience basically controls how it's going to interpret the story. Well, it's often very difficult to predict how people are going to write, how, how people are going to react to something that you write. And you know, there are fascinating cases where the reaction that was produced to something that somebody wrote uh, uh, was quite different from what the writer intended. Uh, one such case, for example, was uh, Upton Sinclair wrote the, his famous novel, The Jungle, about a meatpacking plant in, in Chicago. And he wrote this because he was concerned about working conditions and how hard people were worked and that the machinery was dangerous and you know they were paid too little and so on. Readers reacted, and it became a bestseller, readers reacted with horror at the picture of what went into cans of meat. 
and that there was no inspection and there was, you know, germs and all kinds of gunk was ending up in these cans and so on. And he said, you know, I aimed at the American people's heart and I hit them in the stomach. Uh, so sometimes you don't have any control over how people are going to react. Um, and, uh, uh, but I think you still have to try to tell the story that you think is the important one. And if you do it through the means of telling one person's story, say, like suppose I was able to go back there, find that miner I had met, do a profile of him, uh, use it to show what people's life are there. There's always the danger that, you know, readers are going to write in. I mean, it's not a danger in a way, but readers are going to write in and, and, and they may say, well, you know, here's a gift of $100, please send it to him and so on and tell us how he's doing. And then the fact that <clears throat> he was able to get together enough money to go back to school or get a college degree or something will make people feel the problem has been solved. Well, a good writer has to frame the story in a way that it's clear that, you know, solving most of these problems is nowhere near uh, that simple because we're talking about a system of inequity and not, you know, just an unfortunate person here and there. Yeah, in back. I was wondering about uh, suppression of the uh, Belgian genocide, because I know the Armenian uh, genocide is still suppressed as much as they can. What, do they, does the government in, of Belgium try to suppress uh, this story? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting and complicated story. First of all, I wouldn't call it a genocide, because unlike what happened in Armenia or the Holocaust, it was not an attempt to deliberately wipe out all members or most members of a particular ethnic group. It was a system of forced labor that produced deaths on a genocidal scale. But genocide was not really the intention. And in fact, in the 1920s, when the Belgian colonial officials saw how rapidly the population was diminishing, you can actually find them saying on paper, we have to change this system because if we keep on like this, there'll be no labor force left. Um, well, it was officially suppressed for a long time, talk about forced labor. Uh, I think for a number of reasons. First of all, nobody in the larger countries, um, by, you know, the Morel and the so-called Congo reform movement uh, created a tremendous ruckus about this, uh, principally in Britain and the United States, but in other countries as well, uh, between about 1900 and 1913 or so. Uh, then people in uh, the United States, Britain, France were very eager to swiftly forget about this because all of Allied war propaganda in World War I was based on coming to the aid of poor, innocent, violated, neutral little Belgium. And in fact, Belgium was horribly treated and invaded you know, by the Germans and thousands of people shot and so on during World War I. So it was not convenient to remember any of this then. Uh, then after the war, it was clear that colonialism was going to go on in Africa with, with uh, no changes. The Allies took over the German colonies. And in, by the 1950s and 60s, I would say there was something of a tradition of anti-colonial scholarship started in countries like Britain and France. But uh, not so in Belgium. It was a smaller country. Uh, you know, then as now uh, uncomfortably divided between French speakers and Dutch speakers, and two of the very few things that these two groups have felt they had in common was the myth of the glorious colonial past and the monarchy. So nobody was very eager to hear nasty things about King Leopold. Plus, in Belgium, you know, off, the, the country's small enough so that the field of African studies in Belgium was quite tightly controlled by one or two people. And they were quite conservative people. So that the dissident scholars, uh, and there were some, never got jobs at, at the top universities in, in African studies. That started to change today, but for many years that was the case. 
also in Belgium, unlike the other colonial powers, there were quite powerful institutions devoted to burnishing the glorious colonial past. Um, King Leopold uh, actually started an enormous museum, the Royal Museum for Central Africa, which is on the outskirts of Brussels, largest museum in the world specifically concerned with Africa, and it's in Belgium. And up until uh, the late 1990s, there was nothing in that museum that told you anything about the millions of Congolese who had been killed or starved or uh, <clears throat> died in uprisings. Uh, during his regime. Nothing about forced labor, absolutely zero. Uh, and they even had uh, a, rubber a rubber plant there. Uh, this has begun to change in recent years. I was actually back there this summer, uh, and for the first time the museum actually has quite a good exhibit on the colonial period. They also have something that today is called the Royal Academy of Overseas Studies. It used to be called the Royal Academy of Colonial Studies, which has a, for years, has had a very heavily subsidized publishing program of scholarship uh, in several languages, uh, French, Dutch, English, German, about the colonial period. But, and these books are an enormous series. You can see them all. They're in the Berkeley Library on the shelf. They fill one of those bookshelves from top to bottom. And there are only two of them that I can recall out of these more than 100 books that even mention the forced labor system. So there has been a pretty well-organized effort at forgetting all this. But um, younger and dissident Belgians are uh, now starting to come to terms with it in quite interesting ways, and uh, um, uh, two groups of them invited me there to speak in June because this past June was the 50th anniversary of Congolese independence. And very friendly audiences, some Belgians, some Congolese, and I was pleased to see a sort of level of talk about this that one didn't find 10 or 15 years ago, about right in front here. Um, Uncle Tom's Cabin is fiction, and The Jungle is fiction, and I'm wondering if you could talk about the, well, even a lot of memoirs um, are fictionalized. They have to be. People don't have that good a memory normally. So I was just curious what you think about the relative um, merits of nonfiction versus fiction in drawing attention to these issues, and whether you have considered resorting to fiction in telling some of your stories? Um, well, there, there's some monarchist Belgians who would say I do write fiction. Uh, <laughs> but I point them to 850 footnotes, so uh, I can claim that it's not. But some of those refer to memoirs, which may be fiction. Uh, a few refer to, yeah, some do refer to, to memoirs. Um, although the memoirs are, the, the actual memoirs that I used are almost all by people on the colonialist side who end up saying quite incriminating things about themselves. Uh, and I think fiction can be a useful tool. You know, Uncle Tom's Cabin certainly was. Uh, many writers, you know, who've written about race in this country uh, uh, look at the impact that To Kill a Mockingbird uh, had on on a later generation of Americans. Uh, I wish I were capable of writing novels. Uh, I don't seem to be. I have tried. The only fiction I've ever been able to get published was a children's book. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm reduced to nonfiction. Uh, but I've enjoyed writing that. And, and that happens to be my particular way of doing it. So why don't we pass the microphone down here. We'll sort of keep it circulating around this way. And then we'll go over to the, this side. In the past 15 years, hundreds of thousands of Eastern, Northeastern Congolese women have been raped. Most recently, the end of July, the 1st of August, 250 women, children, and some men were raped by Mai Mai and some of the yeah. Hutu refugees uh, or Hutu genocide heirs who are in the Congo. That story hit the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Chronicle, and it's sort of a splash in the pan, and then we forget about it. Mm -hmm. How do we tell that story so it has a lasting impact so we can get people to do something about it. Because those rapes are going on now 15 to 35 to 70 a day in the Eastern Congo. I know. Um, 
I, I was in a, uh, a center for rape victims in a little village in eastern Congo a year ago, June, and uh, there were about 30 women there. And just during the course of the three hours that we were there interviewing uh, people, two women walked in off the road uh, who had been raped and had been walking ever since that had happened to get to this place. So it is a huge, huge, huge problem. And I don't think we have solved the problem of how do you make people care about this. Uh, one of the reasons why I think it is hard to draw attention to it, there are a lot of journalists, you know, myself included, who have who've written about this. Uh, there are some good documentary films that touch on it. Um, uh, an extraordinary film by a woman named Lisa Jackson, who, which was shown on campus here, I think, a year or so ago, who actually went out and interviewed some of the rapists. Um, it makes a flash in the pan, as you say, and then it goes away. I think that one reason is that this is something for which there is no easy, quick solution. There are some, there are some ways in which human rights activists in other times and places had it easier because uh, there appeared, at least, to be a quick solution. Slavery, it was clear what you had to do. You had to make it illegal. It was no, it was no longer legal for one human being to own, to own another. And that, they thought, would solve the problem. Well, of course, it didn't solve the problem of you know, inequity, distribution of wealth between former slaves and former slave owners. And we're still working on that one. Uh, but it, it nonetheless was something that was an enormous step forward and that people could see as a solution. The Congo reformers thought they had a solution, too, which was that this territory should no longer be the private property of King Leopold II, it should become a Belgian colony where, of course, it would be efficiently and honestly governed like all European countries governed their colonies. They had their own kind of naivete about this. Um, with this problem of the mass rapes, it is very, very hard to say what the solution is. Uh, and it's still harder to impose that solution from the outside. I think that's one thing that discourages people and that makes that story drop off the front pages so rapidly. Um, it's also, you know, simply the, the classic story of trying to get people to care about people far away in a country whose politics are colossally complicated. Uh, and whom we find harder to identify with than people who have the same skin, skin color, who live in places that seem a little bit more like us somehow or other. There's no easy solution. How about one more on this side, and then we'll take the mic over to the other side. Um, I'm just wondering, you've been writing about human rights issues for um, so many years. I'm wondering, I have a kind of two-part question, if um, you've seen any change of uh, interest in those sorts of stories from news outlets, and also what you think of the fact that um, now we see more and more human rights workers and human rights organizations putting out, doing the, the storytelling themselves. Um, you know, Human Rights Watch does a lot of multimedia work, or Human Rights Workers, um, Human Rights Watch, like former employees have written some great books. Um, just what you, what you think of that, that more people are getting their uh, you know, understanding of these issues from human rights workers themselves rather than you know, unbiased uh, journalists? Well, some of the changes I've seen are this. I think that uh, before the Cold War ended, there was always much more of a tendency for the press to report on you know, human rights issues uh, in Soviet bloc countries, uh, or in communist China at the point when we were not, not friends with them. Um, and much, they're much slower to pay attention to similar things going on uh, in the Americas. So I think the end of the Cold War has certainly freed things up somewhat uh, there. 
I think it's great that organizations like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International are out there and are trying to tell their story using some of these you know, techniques like video, posting video on their websites, things like this. Um, I heard an extraordinary statistic the other day that, the, that, if I'm not mistaken, that Human Rights Watch has more researchers on the ground in countries outside the United States than the New York Times and the Washington Post combined have foreign correspondents. Uh, so they have to pick up the slack where the press is simply uh, not there, and I'm very glad that, uh, that they're doing it. Um, but I'm always struck by the fickleness and unevenness of the coverage of, of this kind of issue. I think people are attracted you know, journalists are attracted to cover situations where uh, there seems to be uh, a politics that is comprehensible uh, in a way that that of the Democratic Republic of Congo today is so difficult for a foreigner to understand because there are a bewildering number of different political parties, groups, warlords, uh, surrounding countries meddling in what's going on there extremely, extremely difficult to comprehend. I think that's one what makes some people shy away. People are always attracted to report on countries, you know, where they speak the language. I think that's one reason why we had an enormous amount of reporting on apartheid era South Africa, which I think was good and influential and helped add to international pressure on them for change. Um, there were also people there who became media figures like Nelson Mandela, like Bishop Tutu, like, like Steve Biko, that people could begin to identify with here. And I think that's something that helps bring a story alive. But God knows there are 50 or 60 countries around the world where things are at least as repressive today as they ever were in apartheid era South Africa. And we seldom, if ever, hear anything about them. So. Uh, there's much work to be done. Why don't we pass the mic over to this side here because people over here haven't had a chance. Okay. Um, it's fun to think about King Leopold's ghost as a, from your point of view, as a writer. And does, you tell a very plausible story about being a found story with all these phenomenal characters, an amazing plot line, and even two phases of the atrocities and then the campaign. Um, and the book works beautifully that way. There's a lot more craft, of course, involved. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask about one aspect of that, which is the complexity. If one thinks about it, there's an incredible number of strands going on in it. Um, I mean, if Casement's homosexuality is just one tiny example of these, these hundreds of things. Did you find yourself, as you dug into all this material, a tremendous amount of, of information and detail, did you ever find yourself feeling uncertain about what your audience would be able to stick with? Because the gap between what they would know on page, by page 50 and what you knew at that point was mm. so tremendous and growing as it went. And how did you kind of find a reality check beyond your talent for doing so, which must be part of it? Well. You know, it's funny, I had the problem less with that book than I had with others. Um, I think because in, in large part, the raw material for writing a story about the era covered by King Leopold's ghost is somewhat limited. Uh, you may remember that at, uh, at the end of his uh, rule over the Congo in 1908, just before he was forced to give it up, King Leopold burned all the documents, lit a fire, lit the furnace at the royal palace in the summer of 1908. It burned for a week, and he destroyed everything. Well, that made my job easier, because if he hadn't had that fire, I would have had to spend another year or two in Belgium pouring through documents, and, and God knows how long that, that would have taken, and how, that would have complicated the story. So the amount of raw material to look at was um, was not infinite. It was limited. 
And it pretty quickly leapt out at me that these were the characters whom I had to tell the story through. And when I, when I write a book, I'm always looking for characters that, that you know, a group of characters through whom I could, I could tell the story. And in large part, that depends on whose lives you can get a rich array of information about. Casement was one of those people. Morell was another. George Washington Williams, uh, Leopold himself, Stanley. Uh, I, I wish desperately that there could have been more Congolese there. But as I say, we just don't know mo much information about their individual lives. When I started writing the book, actually, and this goes to the question you asked over here, uh, an African novelist who's a friend of mine said, uh, big mistake, you have to write this as a novel. You can't write it as straight history because it's going to be skewed towards the white characters. And he was right in a sense. But in, were I a novelist, maybe I would have done it a different way. So it was not a problem for me on this particular book. It has been a problem on other books of just getting overwhelmed with the wealth of material. Uh, I just finished a book that I was working on for six years about um, the First World War, where I'm telling the story in terms not of the fight between one side and the other, but a fight between people who believed the war was something noble and necessary and people who believed it was madness and refused to fight, um, and uh, many of whom went to prison. Uh, and the First World War is such a vast subject area. You know, you look at the interlibrary catalog and 120,000 books on the subject. Only 80,000 are in English, so that cuts it down a little bit. But <laughs> I got totally lost there. I had a first draft that was 65,000 words too long, and I had to cut them out, that out. But in this book, it wasn't a problem. Um, mine is sort of more of a methodological question. Um, do you find that people are reluctant to talk about some of the difficult issues that you write about? And if so, how do you go about overcoming that uh, in the interest of telling these stories and building these characters that have a depth to them that helps make the story more, more uh, widely available or more interesting? Or well, when... When it's a matter of writing history, if the history's far enough back, that's not an issue because the people are no longer around to slam the door in your face. Uh, when, as a journalist, you're going out and trying to get people to tell story, tell you their stories, uh, yes, they often are reluctant to talk, and then you just say thank you very much and go on to the, the next one. But it always does amaze me and sometimes humble me uh, how willing some people are who've been through horrible things. You know, I interviewed two women uh, at this rape treatment center in, in Eastern Congo who themselves had been raped and who described the experience in great detail. They wanted their stories told. And I wrote about that in the New York Review of Books article. Um, sometimes you also find perpetrators who are who want their stories told. That, to me, actually is even more interesting than talking to victims, because I think traditional journalism about human rights or, or anything else, or natural disasters or anything is, you know, you hear the victim's story. And obviously, we want people to care about the victims, but it's always fascinating to me when perpetrators talk. Uh, I did a book about 20 years ago about how Russians were coming to terms with the legacy of Stalinism. Uh, the most fascinating book to research that I think I've done, because I went and lived there for six months, uh, learned enough Russian to interview people. And uh, at one point, um, I was, was told that, you know, the, the former, the retired uh, head of a secret police prison in Siberia lived in a particular house and that he might be willing to talk to me. Went there, he brought out his bottle of vodka, he brought out his photograph albums, he talked for two hours and about how wonderful things were in the good old days. Everybody wants to tell their story. Uh, and uh, I had the same experience working in apartheid era South Africa, um, you know, interviewing the head of a neo-Nazi group at one point whom I 
was sure was not going to want to talk to an American reporter. He said, you know, come on over. Uh, so more people than you think want to tell their stories. And if there's a, you know, if somebody doesn't want to, you don't press them. You just go on to the next person who is willing to talk. Um, I found your whole discussion about storytelling really interesting because I work in communications for an organization called Heal Africa that's based mm. in Goma. Yeah, I went to the hospital. Oh, good. Oh, I'm so glad. Um, and one of the things we really struggle with, we have two elements we struggle with in storytelling. One is confidentiality. The New York Times article Carrie referred to published the photo and name of the victim's story it was telling. Um, and, you know, Congo is a place with Internet access, and yeah. that means people she knows will probably see that article. And then the other element, um, and just I would love your comments on your thoughts around that as a journalist, but also someone close to issues on Congo and human rights. Um, and then the other element is just how to tell the broader story of Congo beyond victims and perpetrators, which kind of does go back to the complexity issue, but... Um, how can we help people see that bigger story that you very much see when you, you go there? Well, um, I think the confidentiality question is something that journalists face all the time. I mean, obviously, one simple answer is if somebody doesn't want their name and photograph you know, used, you obviously have to, have to respect that and bend over backwards to respect that. But sometimes you have to do more than that because a person may not realize that uh, when you tell your story, they're, they're not just talking to somebody who's you know lives ten thousand miles away, but you know who a few days later what they write will be available on the internet, and you may have to step in and uh, say I don't think it's a good idea for you to uh, let me use your your real name or talk to other people on the scene who can make that judgment for you. When I wrote about this uh, rape treatment victim center I went to, which was about two hours away from, from Goma, I did send what I wrote first to the uh, woman from Human Rights Watch who'd taken me there. And she said, uh, we got to change the names. So we did. Um, then for another piece I wrote about something else that w was in the Atlantic, uh, I also uh, changed somebody's name but uh, made the mistake of changing it to a name which turned out to be the name of a real person. Happily, that was caught by a fact checker at the Atlantic. <laughs> we changed the name yet again. So, but I do think it's something that, that uh, any writer owes the people they, they, they work with and uh, best to err on the side of caution there. How to explain the situation of Congo in a few words, when it is so enormously complex, is very difficult. It's much easier to understand a place like apartheid era South Africa, where there seem to be clear victims and clear villains. Uh, Congo's enormously complicated. What I do is to tell people one of the reasons it's complicated is that here is this country with you know 60 to 70 million people uh, that is enormously rich in natural resources. Uh, probably, you know, in wealth under the ground per capita, possibly the richest place uh, per capita per, or per square mile, one of the richest places on earth, and that for many years it's had no functioning government. And that makes for a situation of enormous complexity where power is vested in those shreds of the government that do function, in warlords, in armies from the surrounding countries, in some multinational corporations that are able to operate there. But it is bewilderingly complex, and there is no way of summing it up uh, simply. And the longer I was there, I felt the less I understood it, in a way. So I have kind of a two-part but personal question. So first, what called you to write King Leopold? What, what drew you to that story and compelled you to do that? And the second part is, how different was it writing your book, your memoirs about your father compared to all the history books you've written? Well, the memoir about my relationship with my father was my first book. And in a way, it was uh, a lot easier because uh, 
Uh, I didn't have to do any research. The research was all there. Uh, <coughs> and uh, so it was a different kind of writing, much more personal. Um, what, uh, and you know, conceivably, I may return to that genre if anything happens to me in my life that I think is worth writing about, but I don't think uh, it would be terribly interesting to write a memoir about the experience of writing history. I'd rather bring those, bring those patches of history alive. What drew me to write King Leopold's Ghost was simply that uh, I came across a passing reference to uh, 10 million people killed in King Leopold's Congo in, some, in a book I was reading on another subject entirely. And I was so startled by this that I, uh, I was in the middle of writing another book at that time that I just kind of put it aside and said, you know, I've got to go to the library and just see what I can find about this. So I did go to the library. Uh, I started looking at general histories of Africa, and I found that every time somebody gave a figure, it was you know, 8 million, uh, maybe 12 million, maybe 13 million, maybe 10 million, maybe only 7 million. And I thought, that's a lot of people to die in one territory. Uh, and, but those figures were, were consistently high. And in a very well-known book, Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism, she uses a figure of 11 million people died in King Leopold's Congo. But it's only in a footnote. So I just got curious about what the hell went on and why did so many people die? And I started reading about the story and getting the outlines of what happened. And then gradually I realized that there are some extraordinary characters here. And, um, you know, I've got to tell it through these characters. And then I just got totally sucked in and uh, um, went from there. In contemporary reporting on Africa, it's often covering like foreigners or usually white people doing good things to help Africans. But Africans take a back seat to that, and if they are covered, it's someone exceptional like Nelson Mandela. And just wondering if that's something that you see as a problem and how you combat that or if you can combat that? It's it's a huge problem because I think the in press coverage of other parts of the world, we always pay disproportionately a vast amount more of attention uh, to things that happen to Americans. I mean, I guarantee you, if 35 American women a day were being raped in the Congo, that story would be on the front pages nonstop. Um, you know, horrible massacres in El Salvador went on uh, throughout the 1970s and 80s. But I think people really only noticed when those American nuns were killed. Uh, there's no way around that, no easy way around that, except for journalists and human rights activists to work harder than ever to try to humanize and bring alive people in these countries who are uh, you know, suffering death, rape, imprisonment, torture, uh, and try to make people care about them in the way that we would care about, you know, uh, somebody there who who was from our country. Uh, that is a big is a big barrier, and there's no easy way around it. Hi, um, I was really interested in the box in the article that you wrote on the, the myth of blood diamonds, mm -hmm. because I think that. You know, with storytelling, it can be very effective, but first you have to get people to want to read the story, and sensationalist statements are often a way to do that. And I'd heard about an advocacy group in D.C. that in their materials on Congo were using the phrase rape laptops, sort of play off of blood diamonds. And so do you have any suggestions for sort of how to talk about these issues in a way that is honest and doesn't over-sensationalize um, but still grab attention? You know, um, that is what makes Congo such a hard issue to, to, to deal with. Because, you know, everything else that, that 
you know, contemporary political issues that I've been involved with in my life, um, starting in the 1960s when I was briefly a civil rights worker in the American South, it was clear what had to be done. You know, segregation was the law. The law had to be changed. Then U.S. was involved in Vietnam. It was, you know, clear what had to be done. We had to withdraw. Uh, <clears throat> you know, similarly, you know, we should have withdrawn a long time ago from Iraq and from Afghanistan as well, I believe. But when it comes to Congo, it is vastly more complicated than that because there isn't one simple thing to be done that would clearly at least make a huge first step towards solving some of the problems. Um, I, think, I am not optimistic that the conflict minerals legislation, um, which a version of which did get passed, is going to do much of anything because um, the great majority of mineral exports coming out of the Congo are, are not actually from areas where conflict is going on right now. Uh, plus, it is extremely hard to police and identify exactly where stuff comes from. Uh, you know, you have an ounce of gold, if it's pure gold and it's, you know, it's been melted down and refined and so forth, there's no way you can tell where it came from. You can forge certificates of origin. The border is porous. Uh, vast amounts of minerals are now exported from Rwanda that are, um, you know, officially you know, products of Rwanda, but in fact they've been slipped across the border. Um, so I just don't think it's a very effective way of, of attacking this problem. Although I think there have been times in the past when boycotts and embargoes uh, have been a very useful tool. Uh, I think the, you know, the kind of pressure that was put on South Africa that way 20 years ago was enormously important. Uh, and there have been other times when consumer boycotts can be a, a useful uh, thing to do. But, you know, w every computer ship, every, every laptop does have coltan in it, but the percentage of that coltan on the world market that comes from Congo varies uh, quite erratically over time. Uh, depending on the price of the metal and whether somebody has just found a big new deposit of coltan in Australia. Uh, and it used to be that a very large proportion of coltan came from the Congo. Now it's much smaller. It may go up again. I, I just don't think it's an effective organizing tool. Do I have an effective alternative organizing tool? I'm afraid I don't. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's very complicated and... Um, there are, uh, you know, there's a, there's a complex combination of things that one could do, but that one of the great tragedies of that, that country is that because there had been so many years without a functioning government, the, the amount that the outside world, even if it had the best of intentions, could do to solve the problems is quite limited. And the outside world very often doesn't have the best of intentions because, uh, you know, everybody wants to get their own multinationals established there. Um, I guess this this is just more of a, a broader question uh, relating to your your process as uh, as a journalist, as a writer, when and at what point. Uh, would, do you feel when people they're they're trying to communicate? Uh, they speak to you about such unspeakable human rights atrocities, and they're trying to communicate their stories of pain to you. At what point, as writer, is there ever a point? I guess what I'm wondering is where you feel content that you're able to com communicate a pain which in which cannot be put in words. But is there ever a point as a writer when you feel that? At what point do you feel you've kind of been just to their stories? Well, uh, often I think you, you, you never feel that you've been fully just to somebody's story. Uh, because even if I accurately report, 
what somebody tells me about the experience of being raped, am I really able to convey that? I don't think so. Um, all you can do is sort of try your best uh, and use every storytelling technique in the book to try to figure out what's the most effective way you can convey this. What are the details that are really going to resonate with people? Um, but I, I, I never feel in those cases that I've fully conveyed somebody's story. Thank you for your outstanding writing. I would like to know what has been the response from the international community toward your uh, writing, and uh, in particular, uh, has the United Nations uh, taken any particular action as a result of your reports? Well, I, I'm, of course, not the only person who's written about uh, the Congo, either historically or uh, uh, especially to today, when uh, many, many journalists have been there and have written a lot. And some good filmmakers have done work there as well. Um, as far as the response to King Leopold's ghost goes, uh, it's been very interesting to watch. Uh, a, uh, a person who worked in the Belgian Foreign Ministry leaked to me a memorandum that was sent to all Belgian diplomatic posts around the world about three years after the book was, was published. Uh, with instructions on how to answer embarrassing questions rising from people who had read this <laughs> book by an American. And I was able to, to report on that in a new afterword to a more recent edition of, of King Leopold's Coast. So that was fun. Uh, I think the book helped spur uh, some of the changes that took place at this enormous museum on the outskirts of Brussels. Um, right after the book was published, um, and it was published in Belgium in both the languages there at the same time as it appeared in English, the director of the museum made the mistake of appearing at a press conference at a human rights film festival in Brussels. And somebody asked him, are you contemplating any changes at the museum? And he said, yes, but it will be done on a scientific basis and not as a result of that disreputable book by an American. <laughs> <laughs> So that makes one feels, feel good as a, as a writer. Um, the, uh, a year, the year after King Leopold's Ghost was published, there was a Belgian author, Ludo de Witt, who's since become a friend, who published a book about uh, Belgian complicity in the assassination of Patrice Lumumba, the, the uh, first uh, uh, democratically chosen prime minister in the Congo. And that book created a tremendous storm uh, and uh, resulted in an investigation by the Belgian parliament, which essentially verified all of his, his uh, findings. And it was a great pleasure this summer, uh, Ludo and I shared a speaker's platform in, Lie in Liège, and he said, we're, we're the two enemy, public enemies number one here together. And it was a lot of fun. And actually, there was a considerable amount of um, public talk and uh, uh, debate at the time of the 50th anniversary of Congolese independence in, in Belgium when, as I mentioned, I, I was there to give these talks because uh, there was a question of whether the king of Belgium should or should not go to the commemorative ceremony in Kinshasa because 50 years ago uh, the previous king, his brother, uh, who's now dead, had gone and given a famously arrogant speech, which provoked an angry reply by Lumumba. And it was that reply which really sealed Lumumba's death warrant. So big debate, should the king go, shouldn't he go? Finally, the king went, uh, but was instructed by the government to say nothing during the four days that he was there. Uh, <clears throat> and so I actually found myself on Belgian television asked, you know, should the king go or not? Uh, and that was fun. And then Ludo de Witt, this uh, a Belgian author who'd published the book on the assassination of Lumumba, the week that the king made this trip, released some new information that he'd discovered uh, 
showing that the previous king had been fully in the know on the assassination plot. And that created a big uproar. And then he and Lumumba's grandson and a group of other Belgians and Congolese announced that they were going to bring a lawsuit uh, against surviving Belgians who took part in the assassination plot. And they timed this very carefully for just when the papers were going to be filled with the story of the royal visit to Congo. So it was, it was very interesting being there when this was going on and seeing how much, you know, these issues of history are still points of contention today.